Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Excellent. So you all respond. This is already a good presentation. Um, well, good morning. My name is Mark Thacker. I'm the Principal Technical Product Manager for Red Hat Enterprise Linux Security. Um, and we are here to talk today about Red Hat Security and what the roadmap is. Um, I'm sure that there will be people that want to take pictures of quote unquote roadmaps, but trust me, the slides will be available. You'll be able to download all of the, all of the content, so don't feel like you have to write everything down. Uh, but before I get started, I do want to introduce my co-presenters today, both Nathaniel and Brian. Uh, can I ask you guys to stand up? You'll be hearing them for a minute. Turn your microphones and introduce yourselves. <laughs> hey. uh, I'm Brian Ackeson. I work in IT at Red Hat. Uh, I'm Nathaniel McCullum, and uh, I'm a, a crypto security engineer. So. Awesome. Thank you, guys. You'll be hearing from uh, Brian and Nathaniel a little bit later as we do a bit of a deep dive on network-bound disk encryption, which is part of our policy-based decryption technology that we're offering in RHEL. Uh, really very interesting product. I like to say it's when you see this product in action, this technology in action, it's the most incredibly awesome, boring demo ever because it just works which is exactly what you want it to do, right? So we'll talk more about that in just a minute. But let's, um, let's kind of go through and uh, realize the clicker's not working. There we go. All right, real quick. Yes, I actually have to read this slide to you. The content set forth here and does not constitute in any way a binding or legal agreement or impose any legal obligation or duty on Red Hat. This information is provided for discussion purposes only and is subject to change for any or no reason. It's the no reason part that as a product manager I'm happy about. What I do. Um, so just to be clear, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to be talking a little bit about what we offer today in all of our Red Hat products, kind of foundation technologies, uh, what, what security techniques we have that are built into our products. And then I'll be giving you a glimpse at the trends that we're seeing, uh, which is not a promise for delivering necessarily against those trends. Uh, we were just having an interesting conversation up here about one of those uh, activities right now. But where we want to go, especially in the areas of the foundation technology, the hybrid cloud area, and in automating security compliance. And finally, because some of you may be looking at this after Summit, there is a whole set of links at the end for other sessions, breakout sessions, and content related to security here at Summit. Um, and I would ask, we have a lot of content that we're going to be covering. If you can hold your questions, note them down, hold them to the end. Uh, because, like I said, we have a lot of content. I'm a product manager. You can do death by slides any day. And that's not the intention, but we do have a lot to cover today. So we're happy to answer questions. We'll be around after this. I'll be going right over to the booth after this. Happy to meet with you. Uh, Brian and Nathaniel are here to meet with you as well. Okay? All right. Well, wait a minute. This is Red Hat, and we're here talking about security. So what's up with that? Because last time I checked, Red Hat's not a security company. We don't actually make a security product, a standalone product that you buy from us. We don't make firewalls. We don't make security intrusion uh, event analysis tools. So what is the deal? The key is that Red Hat really does treat security as a lifestyle. We integrate the security technology into everything that we do, um, which is especially interesting considering that we work entirely in the open source world. Right, so we work with the open source community to bring security into the technologies that we pull into our enterprise class products. This number is actually slightly wrong, but there's at least over 50 sessions, labs, breakouts, et cetera, here at Summit all about security, which is pretty impressive for a non-security company. Right? Um, I, I Literally, I can't even get into all of the labs and, and all the talks about security. So there's just a lot going on. So what does that mean then in terms of how we, working in the open source community, build security into the products that we ship to you? So I want to spend just a couple of seconds talking about Red Hat's supply chain security. All right, now we do work in the open source community. There's a bajillion projects. I know the number's not a bajillion. But there are thousands of projects out there in the open source community. Red Hat is very picky about what we choose to ship. Uh, we do not just pick packages up and call ourselves the distro, especially in the case of RHEL, and just ship it out the door, right? We have a lot of work that we do for something that's in the upstream, including the Fedora. Anyone here running Fedora, by the way? Excellent. 
Good job. These two guys don't count. They're on their development team. Uh, by the way, I do have a laser pointer. I see several people from Red Hat in here. I'm not afraid to use a laser pointer, so just let me know. Our participation in the open source community is about establishing leadership, especially in the security space and especially in the cryptography space. We work in the community to develop the security standards, right? We have members of steering bodies, uh, et cetera. We're very picky about what packages we choose to include in our enterprise class products. And when we do choose to include something, we're looking, that, we're looking for something that's stable, uh, standards-based, and supportable, right? We do our own code inspection, both a manual inspection process and automated static code analysis as well. You count on Red Hat to do things like actually package up this technology in a consumable way. You count on us also to be able to show you, by the way, that thing that we built, we can build it again and again and again. It isn't just some developer on his laptop. It isn't just one instance of some system inside of Red Hat that we built it on. We have a build route. We can reproduce our builds, which is especially helpful when we have to go back and do security patching to older technologies. And I'll touch on that in just a minute as well. Of course, we do our own quality assurance, right? And we will continue to provide support for upstream technologies that have long since been abandoned in the upstream community, right? Just because it's not there anymore or not being maintained, if we shipped it, we support it. It's kind of a, I should get a tattoo that says we should. But that's basically the idea. Of course, we digitally sign everything that we ship. We have a secure distribution method for getting that content to you. And like I said, we provide support. Quick side example. I have a slide on this in a little bit. Um, I, there was this thing, what was it called? Spectre and Meltdown, right? I was going to ask how many people had to deal with that. Then I realized, actually, it's 110% of you. So everyone dealt with Spectre and Meltdown. Um, another quick audience participation poll. How many people, this is, you don't have to be embarrassed by this, are running RHEL 5? Ah, scarily more than I thought. OK, great. <laughs> That kernel that is the basis of RHEL 5, do you think anyone in the upstream community is supporting that any longer? No, not at all. But when Spectre and Meltdown happened, it was Red Hat that went back to that old Linux kernel to patch it for Spectre and Meltdown. And by the way, just to kind of toot our own horn, you couldn't take the fixes that were in the upstream community and apply it to the RHEL 5 kernel. They weren't applicable. We had to write it from scratch, right? That's the kind of support that we work on, which is part and parcel with creating secured products. OK. Now, we do all that work. Where does it get applied to? So this is the, the, the uh, standard corporate template of all of our products on one slide. But there is a purpose why I'm showing this to you. Um, when we think of our technologies, we start at the foundation, right, with our storage products and with the thing that I spend a lot of my time on, Red Hat Enterprise Linux, which is deployed across our four footprints, as we like to call them, physical, virtual, private cloud, and public cloud. You actually saw today, if you saw the keynote, you saw the physical deployments, you saw a private cloud deployment. Uh, there was a virtual deployment in there as well. And you saw a public cloud deployment. All of those were running rail behind the scenes. It is the basis of literally everything we do. It's at the core. As we move up, all of the security technology that we've built into the base then feeds up into our middleware, our OpenShift stack, our open uh, stack products. Everything that we do in RHEL can be inherited upstream. As a good example, our cryptographic frameworks, which I'll talk about in just a minute. Uh, the way that we've actually certified our cryptographic uh, frameworks, like uh, GNU TLS, OpenSSL, NSS, those crypto frameworks can be used by the rest of our stack without violating uh, the FIPS uh, encryption standard. In other words, we basically can kind of pass the FIPS certification up the stack to the rest of the products. That doesn't mean that those products don't also maybe need to look at doing some FIPS certification, especially in the case of something like OpenShift, we should use as, uh, Go, and Go has its own crypto that it bundles, so we can talk about that a little bit later. So the foundation runs across four footprint. Our applications run on that. And finally, everything is wrapped up with our management products, Red Hat Satellite, Insights, CloudForms, and Ansible. And we're going to be talking more about the management products at the end of the deck. OK. The way that the rest of this presentation is broken up is into three primary sections. Uh, back to the agenda. 
we are going to be talking first about creating a secure foundation. Then we'll be talking about enabling hybrid cloud deployments. Next, we'll talk about automating compliance, including kind of a, a snapshot, if you will, of what we're seeing trends in terms of bugs and vulnerabilities that we're addressing right now. Uh, it's not so much about automating, but I think you'll find the numbers kind of interesting. All right. Let's talk about the foundation. A lot of the foundation is, like I said before, based around Red Hat Enterprise Linux. So what are we doing today? Uh, in my experience, every time I've come to Summit and I've talked to customers about what we're doing, there's inevitably so much that we deliver in any of our products, as a, any large technology company will, you may not even know that you have some of these capabilities. So that's one of the reasons why these slides exist. So I've broken this into three areas. But in the area of preventing intrusion and, and attacks, uh, the thing that I absolutely will always go back to is talking about SE Linux. It's been around for a long time. It was originally created for kind of government privacy workloads. And it is now the basis of the mandatory access control technology that actually enables OpenShift, OpenStack, and Red Hat virtualization to work. Quick show of hands again, OpenShift, anyone running containers? Congratulations, containers by themselves would not actually work to separate workloads if it was not for SE Linux. So if you're running containers, you are running with SE Linux enabled. It's there. Now we actually make this easy for you because we have our own policy for uh, containers type deployments and for virtual machine deployments called SVIRT. So we turn it on, we pre-configure it for you and you're pretty much good to go. But it is there. Um, other quick technologies. I'm not going to read every one of these bullet points. I just want to hit up upon a few of these that I think are kind of interesting things to remember. USB guard. Uh, this is a technology that when I first described it, most people think it's for laptops. Well, yes, it does have value there, but it has value beyond that. USB guard is the ability for an administrator of a system to determine what class of USB devices can be plugged into that system, which port they can be plugged in on, what times of the day they can be plugged in, and which users get to control that policy. Good example. Most of the time, you want to allow a keyboard to be plugged into your computer. Even if it's a co-location, you might want to have a keyboard plugged in but you probably don't want to have a camera plugged in. And you especially don't want to have anything that's really weird, like, say, a mass storage device that also has a camera. That would be an odd device, right? But it might be something that if you were a hacker, you would want to have plugged into the system, right? So with USB Guard, you can describe classes of USB devices and determine, oh, well, I only want to be able to allow, say, a keyboard during working hours to be plugged in on the front port but not the back port of my server. Right? Clearly, it has applicability in the laptop case as well, but this is something that, that is, is actually a whole class of control that previous to now, you had to go learn special UDEV rules and how to configure UDEV, which I'm not going to do. Uh, but even I can understand how to use USB guards. So it's, it's very interesting technology. I want to move on. Uh, I will touch upon something real quick because I'm going to talk about this later. Starting in Rails 7.5, we've now added full support for trusted platform modules, version 2.0. This is an integrated hardware security module that most of you already have in your systems. Almost any modern server appliance based on Intel already has this TPM support built into it. We're going to be looking at, in the future, exploiting that and using that for other functionality. But as of today, the full API, the full support's there for you. Let's move on to cryptography. One of the things I'm personally very proud of, and I see some of our crypto team sitting here, is that we go out of our way to take the open source cryptographic frameworks that we deliver in RHEL and run them through a very extensive process called FIPS validation or FIPS certification, depending on which part of it you're talking about. Right, this is a government standard, US government standard requirement. It is law in the US that if you're a government account, you must have and only use FIPS certified algorithms. This is a very long process to go through, right? Months and months and months of work. Now, imagine we're doing this from open source code. Not a lot of people are doing that, right? So we do take this very seriously. We certify it. You may ask yourself, I'm not a government customer. What difference does that make? Think about how much time we spend doing work on the crypto framework to make sure that it's solid, it's documented, it's repeatable. We can show you exactly what it's doing. It's been vetted by third parties, right? 
All of that benefits you even if you never turn on FIPS. Okay. We also are active in removing old cryptographic algorithms that have flaws. We take those out of the system as much as possible. We're going to be talking a little bit more about the futures, about where that's headed as well. In the networking and firewall area, from a foundational point of view, uh, we include IPsec and MacSec which allows peer-to-peer -peer encrypted communications. And you're going to see how we leverage that as we go up the rest of the stack as well. That's what we do today. Now, where are we headed in the future? OK, so what's happening in terms of the trends that we're seeing? We're seeing a lot of emphasis put now on advanced cryptographic algorithms and implementations. In particular, uh, there is concern now about what's called post-quantum cryptography. In other words, as quantum computers become a more real thing, a more accessible thing. The concept of breaking a crypto key suddenly becomes uh, quite easy to do depending on your key length if you happen to have access to a crypto computer, right? I'm sorry, a quantum computer. So we're looking at working in the upstream community for new cryptographic algorithms, new longer keys, et cetera, and making that available again in our core platform. Right. That's going to be something that you're going to be hearing from a lot of vendors about because this is a very real concern. We want to also look at making it easier for you to potentially switch which crypto algorithms and, and uh, implementations that you use and have a centralized way of enabling those new cryptographic algorithms. As a quick example, if in the future you want to, uh, you have a policy that says, I need to disable uh, you know, ECC uh, crypto. Uh, maybe there's a flaw in a particular implementation. We want to make it easy for you to go in in one place and turn it off and not have to go around to each individual application and each individual crypto stack and modify config files, right? It doesn't scale well. So we have a, a, a standard across the system crypto framework that we're looking at deploying soon that will allow us to control this kind of setting, if you will, of the sensitivity of the system. Maybe even, for example, uh, when this is rolled out, if you want to be very proactive and say, I would like to go ahead and set up the system to be very future-proof, and I want to only use post-quantum crypto algorithms, do it, right? One command, get it done, all right? That's what we're looking at. I mentioned trusted platform modules. There is, in my opinion, a very uh, interesting renewed effort around hardware root of trust. Uh, sort of was a really hot topic for a while, kind of faded. Uh, to be fair, Microsoft has taken strong advantage of this with uh, BitLocker on Windows systems. But now we're starting to see more interest from our customers around hardware root of trust in a Linux platform as well. Now, there's lots of different ways that a hardware root of trust can work. We really want to try and emphasize the use of PKCS11 technology. It's a standards-based way of addressing hardware security modules. And we want to integrate and make invisible, from an API and developer point of view, access to hardware security modules. We will make things like trusted platform modules more readily accessible, especially in a virtualized world, so virtual TPMs and other HSM as, as well, not necessarily limited to just TPMs. There's a lot of work to be done here. There's a lot of standards work that needs to be done in this space. But this is something we're extremely interested in. In fact, I believe that when we talk a little bit about network-bound disk encryption, uh, Nathaniel will probably kind of give you a little bit of a clue about where we might be going in that space. Uh, and we also have a demo on the show floor of uh, network-bound disk encryption working with TPMs as a forward-looking statement of where we may be headed. The other area that I'm seeing interest in again, again, this has been around for a while, is whitelisting. That's the ability to be very explicit about what it is that you want to execute on the system and everything else is not allowed to execute. This is going to be very important with common criteria certifications that are coming up. Uh, they are going to eventually require that uh, your system have a whitelisting capability. Now, I'm not going to talk a lot about network-bound disk encryption. We have a whole wonderful section on that. All right, two quick slides on identity management and authentication. We include InRel and can be used with the rest of the stack, an integrated identity management product. To be clear, what I'm talking about in this case is 
Linux and Unix user ID management. Right? That's generally what I mean whenever I talk about ID, IDM or identity, identity management. This is very well integrated with Active Directory. We have lots of customers that use Windows Active Directory accounts as the primary means of authenticating into a Linux environment. Right? In fact, most of our customers, the identity master store is in Active Directory. Right? So we need to integrate well with that. We can establish a good trust relationship with Active Directory today. We do have smart card integrations as well. Uh, that's also a, a challenging and evolving space. Uh, anyone here from the government, you know about common access cards, CAT cards, right? So there's lots of changes going on there. So that's uh, uh, lots of improvements as well around identity management and smart card authentication. Again, we also offer a certificate service, right? A certificate server and a directory server. Uh, they do exactly what, as, as the British like to say, the name's on the tin, right? They are certificate providers and directory providers for traditional LDAP models. So Today, the other thing I want to point out is our identity management technology that we, that we tie for Unix and Linux user IDs can also be tied directly into uh, Keycloak, which is our web single sign-on technology. If you saw the keynote today, you saw web single sign-on being used whenever you pulled out your phone and you logged on to Burr Sutter's demo site. Well, that actually can be tied directly back into your underlying Linux user IDs with what we ship today it's part of your RHEL subscription, right? So where else are we going? As we continue to put emphasis around developers and what developers are doing in the middleware stack, look for tighter and better integration of our identity management products with the middleware or the developer tools, right? There's still more work to be done there, still more work around what kind of credentials are going to be interesting and different. There was just, Nathaniel and I were just talking about a new web authentication uh, standard that's just been sort of ratified by the W3C. So that's something that we may be looking at in the future. We're also looking at making it easier to automatically enroll your system into the identity management world, uh, automating that with tools like Ansible. So it's you deploy your system, configure it with Ansible, it's automatically enrolled into identity management. We're also looking at things like containers. Right? There's, there's the capability of running identity management in containers today, but we want to extend that as we continue to look at OpenShift and OpenShift system containers as well. I've already talked about hardware security modules. Uh, we have great integration today, but we want to get even better with that. Again, if we can expose HSMs to a standard interface like PKSS11 and make it easier to think about making that PKSS11 routing capability, maybe you as a developer don't really care where your credentials are stored. I mean, you do care. Everybody cares. But you don't care enough that you need to write specific extensions for specific HSMs, we want to make that easier to use. Okay? All right, so network-bound disk encryption. This is normally the part where I get really excited and talk for 45 minutes about it, but I'm not going to uh, because I have experts here. Uh, I'm not going to read this bullet point, but let me just synopse it to say the interesting part about network-bound disk encryption is this solves the problem of encrypting your disk to prevent it from being stolen and reused and it solves the problem of what I like to call the midnight reboot problem. Right? What happens at midnight when your system boots, you've encrypted it, oh, it's sitting there waiting for a password. Right, so I'm going to turn it over to Nathaniel and Brian. Brian's going to talk a little bit about what Red Hat IT has been doing with this. So, oh, thank you. I'm Brian Ackerson from Red Hat IT, and uh, tell you a little story about how we're using some of these tools internally. Uh, several years ago, uh, we started forming some groups within Red Hat IT on data management, data classification, and most importantly, data security. One of the requirements that came out of that group was that all data, no matter where it's stored, on what device, needs to be encrypted at rest, rest and in transport. So this is really easy to say. It's a lot harder to do, especially in, in a Linux world where you're looking at using Lux everywhere, and, and our environment is, of course, you know, 95% plus Linux. So we want to use Lux, but at the same time, this poses uh, some huge challenges when looking across the entire enterprise and you know, tens of thousands of VMs and physical hosts. So uh, we, we started going around collecting some requirements, and our, our operations teams who have responsibility for production operations of our systems 
uh, everything from the website to internal tools that we use, uh, had some very large concerns like, hey, I need to be able to reboot VMs and to apply patches without requiring you know, someone pulling up the rev console and 3 a.m. in the morning typing in a Lux password to boot the VM. Uh, that's no fun and certainly not scalable to you know, any more than a handful of VMs or physical systems. Uh, the operations teams also, of course, wanted an automatable solution. Um, we do everything we do is, is automated. So these, uh, the, the data encryption solution had to be able to be completely hands-off, just manage itself, and introduce a, a very secure foundation for this uh, customer data. So we also needed the solution to be deployable across both our internal data centers, cloud solutions, AWS, Azure, wherever. We didn't want to have to re-implement a solution depending on where the data lived. We wanted a single a platform for encrypting data at rest that could be used everywhere. And of course, we, the data needed to be able to be recovered and offline. If we lose a data center, you know, and we needed to be able to manually recover the data if we need to, or take a boot a system in the offline mode and boot it up and, and be able to retrieve data with, you know, in an isolated environment. And of course, we needed a multi-site and highly available active-active uh, solution. And my team uh, handles the internal identity and access management for Red Hat. So everything from SAML to, um, you know, running Keycloak to IDM, directory server, certificate server. So we have a lot of uh, experience with escrow servers. Escrow servers are horrible. Um, they will be the first thing that breaks when you have an outage. And of course, that will be what delays recovery if you have a site-wide outage. Your escrow server is not going to be available. You won't be able to get things back up and running uh, in, in any kind of short time frame. Uh, of course, we wanted it to be open source and completely standards based. Uh, we have some proprietary so uh, software used in Red Hat, but for the most part, we, we standardized on open source and, of course, Red Hat solutions. And so we started exploring the, the solutions that were available on the market at the time and in the open source world, and there wasn't really anything that met all of these requirements. And about that same time, we were introduced to Nathaniel, who had some very, was working on a very interesting project that I'll tell you about now. Yeah, so we had uh, very similar requirements that we were hearing from customers, and uh, there was a lot of pain points, as Brian mentioned, particularly around escrows. You can just do okay. a quick okay. sure. um, So uh, we came up, uh, what we effectively call the network bound disk encryption is essentially two products. Uh, one is called Clevis. And it is the client-side integration. And we have another one called Tang, which is the server-side. And uh, this is a completely pluggable system. So uh, on the client side, uh, we have Clevis, which is a decryption automation framework. And its purpose is to allow for automated decryption using a variety of methodologies. We're going to talk about uh, how widely we can actually uh, use those, as well as how we can combine them. Uh, Clevis provides integration with Lux. This includes uh, early boot uh, using Drakeit before uh, we even get the root file system. And uh, this includes system D for things like non-root volumes. So if you've got a data partition you want to encrypt, you can do it uh, uh, with Clevis there. Uh, we also have integration with GNOME. Uh, so on your desktop, for example, you can have a USB key that you plug into your laptop and it automatically uh, is mounted and decrypted uh, completely transparently to you. Um, so that, those are so, uh, some of our initial integrations. We have others uh, that are coming as well, uh, but that's what we have right now. Um, and then uh, we have a concept of pins, uh, which are generally speaking plugins that allow you to enable a bunch of different encryption policies. Now one thing that's really unique about the way Clevis actually works is that you define your decryption policy at the time you encrypt the data. And that policy is cryptographically verified, right? So we're not talking that there is some special privileged actor which has access to see a bunch of things and which you hope doesn't have any vulnerabilities. Everything that we do in Clevis is fully backed by uh, the latest cryptographic research and uh, is always mathematically provable. So we, we hope to provide a much stronger security model than what you will typically get uh, in other sort of privileged actor-based systems. 
Uh, we currently uh, have uh, four primary pins that we ship with Clevis. Uh, these include, uh, the first one is integration with Tang, which we will talk about in just a moment. Uh, the second one is with HTTPS-based escrows. And uh, this is because we know that a lot of people already have these systems deployed. We're not trying to force you into our model. Uh, and you can use the existing pin with hopefully your existing escrows uh, without really any modification. Um, so we do provide integration for that if that's the model you prefer or the model you're already deployed on. Uh, we also provide uh, in upstream, we are not currently shipping this in RHEL. Uh, we just merged upstream TPM2 support. Uh, so this is actually now we're moving beyond just simply network bound. Uh, we're moving on to uh, other sorts of hardware integration as well. And then finally, uh, we have a plugin called Shamir Secret Sharing, which is abbreviated SSS. And uh, this allows you to combine policies into meta policies. And we're going to talk about exactly what that looks like on the next slide. Um, so let's talk about the server side. On the server side, uh, we have this application called Tang. And it is a server which basically does everything that an escrow does without being an escrow at all. So in any situation where you have an escrow system and you want to do roughly what an escrow does, you can do the same thing with Tang, uh, but you can do it uh, without all the complications of actually having to run an escrow. Uh, so it's extremely small. Uh, we're talking about roughly 600 lines of C. So it's, it's a very, very small server. It's extremely fast. We can handle, uh, even in the currently unoptimized state, about 3,000 requests a second. And we believe that we can probably get an order of magnitude improvement uh, if needed. But we haven't actually seen anyone even throttle that much. So we haven't, we haven't done more. Um, we, it's also completely stateless. So Tang does not store keys. It actually has zero knowledge about what's going on on the client side. So when you typically have an, an escrow s system set up, uh, what's the m most desirable attack point in your entire network? Well, it's the escrow, because it has all of this information about everything that's going on in your network. Uh, but when you deploy Tang, Tang doesn't know anything about what's going on in your network. All of your clients are anonymous. You don't need to do authentication. And you don't even need transport encryption, because it's a, it's a key exchange. Um, so we, we designed it this way precisely because we're trying to establish foundational infrastructure. One of the problems that we heard from customers is that when they deploy an escrow-based solution, the escrow needs all, sort of, uh, all sorts of infrastructure underneath it just to make it work. But all that infrastructure you build underneath the escrow is the thing that you want to encrypt using the escrow. So you end up in this circular paradigm where you're trying to build infrastructure on top of infrastructure that needs to go underneath the infrastructure you already built. Uh, and this is problematic, which is why we took the approach we did with Tang, where you have something small, fast, and stateless, uh, which can serve as the foundation of your infrastructure, does not require any other integration with other points in your infrastructure, and then you can build everything on top of that. Uh, so Tang operates based upon uh, a, a new cryptographic algorithm uh, called ECMR. Uh, ECMR, uh, also known as the McCollum Relier Exchange, uh, is a variant of Diffie-Hellman. So it's, we're in very well understood cryptographic territory. And essentially what we do is we perform a key exchange so that the client, when it wants to encrypt, it gets the server's key, possibly offline, which is one of the things that we can do with Tang that you can't do with an escrow. Uh, so you get the key from the server, you perform one portion of the key exchange, you now have a key that you can use to encrypt data. When you want to decrypt that data, however, you can't actually calculate that without talking to the remote server. So you still get that requirement that it has to be online, it has to be able to talk to the server for decryption, uh, but then for the, for the decryption, it just simply talks to, to the server. There's no transport of key material over the wire, uh, so everything can be done without transport encryption. Uh, as I mentioned here, no transport encryption is required. So when you have a little problem like heart bleed, Right? Everybody knows about heart bleed, right? I really hope you do. I know it's a little bit old news at this point. But imagine if you've got an escrow deployed with TLS and heart bleed comes along. And now anyone who's on your network can listen to every single key that's transported over your network. We avoid that entire class of attacks by using a key exchange instead of transporting key material over the wire. So uh, yeah, let's, let's move on to the next slide. So uh, here's one such example of what we can do uh, with Clevis, Clevis as an encryption policy. Uh, this is a fairly sophisticated policy. Most people are not deploying something that's this sophisticated. Uh, further, we don't actually implement all of this yet. 
but I'm trying to give you a picture of conceptually what we can do with the system that we're building. So uh, this is a policy tree. We have a bunch of different pins here. These are the plugins for our policy. Uh, the, let's start all the way on the left, and we're going to go from left to right. Uh, so we're going to use Shamir Secret Sharing, that's SSS, with a threshold of one. And you'll notice that there's two branches that come out of this. Uh, because our threshold, T equals one, that means that one of these sides of the branches has to be, has to be evaluated uh, cryptographically correctly in order for things to succeed. So either the top branch or the bottom, right? By specifying T equals one, we're specifying an or relationship. Uh, so, so on the top branch, we have a password, which is the admin recovery password. And this is what you would use as your complete fallback. If everything else burned down in the world, you still have to kind of get at your data, right? So this is the master recovery password. It's always going to work. And, uh, but if you're not going to do the recovery password, we would, if that one doesn't work, so you're not an admin, you don't have that password, you have to follow the other branch of the policy. So now we, we have another branch here, with it, which is another Shamir's. Uh, this time we have uh, T equals 2, so our threshold equals 2. And because we have two branches, it means that both of them are required. So that both branches must evaluate uh, in order for this branch to unlock. So uh, on the bottom here, we'll start at the bottom, we have TPM2, and this means that the hard drive must actually be in the chassis, right? So you can use the master recovery password when the drive is not in the chassis, but the only other way you can decrypt is if the drive is in the chassis. Uh, now we're going to move up to the, to the uh, next branch of Shamir's, and we have T equals 2, so this is a threshold of 2, but this time we have three branches. So we don't require all three branches, we just require two out of three. And th we, the three branches we have are on the top, the user password, so maybe this is a laptop and the user types in their password and they get access, but they can only do so, remember, when it's in the chassis because we've, we've validated the TPM. Uh, and then all, we'll skip all the way to the bottom, and we're going to use here uh, instead a PKCS11 pin to talk to a YubiKey. So uh, now going to the middle branch, we have T equals 2 on our Shamir's. Uh, across three tank servers. So what we've done here is we've created high availability. We have three tank servers on the network. As long as any two of them are available, we can do the decryption. Now remember, because there's, uh, if we go back a couple layers to that, the very middle Shamir's, uh, let me borrow that laser pointer. The red button. The red button? Yeah. All right. So right, right here at this middle Shamir's, uh, we have three branches and we need two of them. This means that uh, if the user is on a secure network, say at work, through this branch, we fulfill this branch of the policy, then we only need this one or this one. So when you're at work, you don't have to type your password. You're on the secure network, and you can just touch your YubiKey button, and you're good to go. You're driving to Crips without having to type a password. But now let's say you go down to the coffee shop down the street, and you're sitting there and you want to decrypt some data. Well, you're no longer on the secure network here, uh, but you do have your YubiKey, and you know your password. So you're doing two-factor authentication once you've moved to a less secure zone. So one of our hopes here, again, not everything here is currently implemented, but our hope is to actually build a framework for us to be able to think conceptually about how we transition across different security zones and how we provide decryption policies that are mathematically evaluated, mathematically provable, uh, and can provide an extremely flexible way for us to interact with our encrypted data. So let's move now to the, to the server side, and we're going to talk about, uh, we're going to talk about Tang. And we've, we've uh, stated that Tang is something that can be used wherever you're using an escrow. You can use Tang instead. And what we wanted to do here is we want to, uh, we want to uh, compare some of the different properties between using Tang versus using an escrow. So at the top, uh, when you're doing client provisioning, if you're using an escrow, you have to be online. That's because the client is going to generate some key and it's going to send the key to the escrow. And if you're not online, the escrow has no way to get the key. Uh, however, if you're using Tang, you can actually do provisioning online or offline because the server doesn't need to know the key. The client only needs to know the server's key. And there's lots of ways to distribute that out of band. So for example, you can just type it in as a prompt. Uh, you can copy and paste it. So um, you could put it in a kickstart. You could put it in an Ansible file. There's lots of ways that you can automate this where you can actually have a secure provisioning network which has no access to the outside world, and then it can only be decrypted once you move it into uh, the new environment. So that, that's number one. Number two is client authentication. 
And this is absolutely required in the case of an escrow because once you've stored that key in that escrow, can anybody just pull it out? Well, I certainly hope not, right? You only want the people that need to have access to that key to be able to get it back out. But because we're not actually storing anything in the server using Tang, uh, we, the clients can actually be completely anonymous. The clients have everything that they need to do the decryption except for talking to the server. So they don't need to get any special information and there, there's nothing that the server can actually provide for them uh, that would give them any advantage uh, even if they were a rogue actor. So third, let's talk about transport encryption. Uh, because you're sending with an escrow key material over the wire, you absolutely have to encrypt that connection. And then if anything fails in that connection, such as Heartbleed, which I've already mentioned, then the, all the keys which are transported over the wire become vulnerable. Uh, but because we're using Tang, we're using a key exchange instead, there's, the only thing that's on the wire is public key material, not private key material. And because of this, we don't need any transport encryption at all, which uh, significantly limits the attack surface. Next, uh, we have state. When you're storing all of these keys in an escrow, you have a bunch of state that's associated, right? I have to know which keys they are. I have to know who gets them. I have to know when they're able to get them and all sorts of sophisticated policy around it. Uh, we also have to make sure that we back up all of those keys and we have to make sure that those backups are secure, right? Are you encrypting your backups? And if so, how are you automatically decrypting your backups? This is that whole chicken and egg problem that we keep talking about. Uh, all of this sort of goes away with Tang, not 100%, but mostly goes away uh, because we can, uh, uh, right now the only piece of state on the Tang server is the Tang server's key and we are working to actually find ways to put that into hardware so that you can actually have all of the cryptographic operations happening inside an HSM or uh, inside a secure enclave or some other technique. And in this case, the server has literally no state and there's nothing that you can actually get from compromising the server. Uh, performance. Escrows are typically slow because of all of the validation that they have to do surrounding whether, you know, whether or not you're allowed to have access to the key, whether or not we're going to read the key off the disk, where the key is stored, etc. Uh, Tang is extremely fast, everything is memory resident, and we can reply extremely fast to, to requests. Deployment for escrows are difficult and manual. You tend generally have to have lots of existing infrastructure that you build your escrow on top of and that makes it difficult. There's lots of fiddly bits of policy and if you get them wrong, you expose all of your keys. It's also something that's uh, manual in the sense that there's a bunch of decisions that you have to make during that deployment, uh, which you have to decide forever and establish policies around. You have to provide passwords and things like that. Uh, so it's a manual deployment. Uh, in contrast, Tang is easy and completely automatable. You literally just turn it on. So if you went to the, um, to the lab we did on Tuesday, uh, you literally just start the service. If you don't have a key, it generates one for you and you're running. So it's extremely easy, extremely automatable. Uh, finally, uh, a chain of trust. When you're using an escrow, a chain of trust is absolutely required because you have to know who the people who are authenticating. You have to know uh, on both sides, you have to perform mutual authentication. Uh, is, it, is it safe for me to send a key to the escrow? Is it really the escrow on the other side of the connection? And uh, with Tang, this is all optional because, again, clients uh, are, are completely anonymous and clients just simply uh, use a trust on first use model just like SSH. So you can, you can decide uh, by either specifying a key value for the server, whether you trust it, or uh, you'll be prompted with the key just the same way you are with your existing SSH experience. So I think that's it for me. I'll turn it back over to Brian. Very good. Am I still on? Yeah. So we went to deploy this, and our initial use case for deploying uh, Clevis and Tank was to back our IDM servers. These are uh, Kerberos and LDAP servers, essentially, that, that store cryptographic data. So we wanted the root volumes on the IDM servers to be encrypted, uh, but we didn't want to have all the drawbacks of you know, having to type in the password manually on reboot and so on. We also have uh, these servers distributed all over the globe. Some are VMs. Um, a large number are bare metal because they exist in regional co-locations where we might not have a large virtualization presence. So it's very important to, to encrypt this data. Uh, so that was our initial use case. We deployed our Tang servers, uh, which are the, the actual uh, servers that the clients will talk, speak to. And our, our deployment model uses, we're, as I mentioned, we're heavy in configuration management. So configuration management lays down um, 
the tank key offline, so it, does, it doesn't need any communication with the tank servers initially for enrollment. It also manages the Lux passphrases and utilizes the various Lux slots that are available on the system to, to store various data and various keys. So this solution works well. Uh, we implemented it um, about a year ago, and we have literally filed zero bugs because it just works. Um, it's, we've been very happy with it. It's now the default standard for all of our new deployments going forward. And in the, the future, in, in RHEL 7.5, uh, NBDE just uh, uh, achieved the ability to decrypt data LUNs. So that's kind of our next step, is to secure data LUNs that, that get mounted on the systems and go beyond just the root volume encryption. And of course, integrating this with uh, the Red Hat storage on the back end devices where the, the Gluster and so on drives are actually encrypted to Lux themselves and use, use NBDE to boot. And then finally, where uh, our initial policy model is fairly uh, simple at this point. We implemented it before a lot of the, the more complex policies were available. Uh, so now we're looking at going back and doing some of the more multi-factor uh, uh, decryption systems that, that Nathaniel spoke about. And so our current policy is the every drive is Lux encrypted. It has uh, of course, the manual password that any admin who has access to that password can actually boot the system in, off the network, take the drive out, and you know if they need to do forensics or whatever, uh, can take it out into a secure environment. Um, if the password is not typed in on boot, then it reaches, it uses the various tang, tang pins that are associated with uh, uh, four or six, depending on the environment, uh, tang servers that are located active, active uh, across multiple data centers. So these systems have to reach back into our data centers to be able to decrypt. This means that uh, instances running in AWS or in a regional colo have to have a working network uh, a function to connect back to our Tang servers to boot. Uh, and we found that this policy works very well. And of course, we're going to be extending it in the future. And that's it for me. Thank you. Awesome. Great. Thank you, Brian and Nathaniel. Uh, I know we're running a little bit over, but uh, I'm not done with slides, so you can just stay here all day as I continue to go through. Uh, let me hit these last two sets of slides real quick, because I think it's important to talk about kind of where we're headed uh, in enabling hybrid cloud and into automating security compliance. All right, so we've actually had several sessions this week about what we're doing in the hybrid cloud. Uh, Lucy Kerner and I did a hybrid cloud roadmap presentation. You're welcome to take a look at that as well. Really, what we're doing is leveraging what we have in the foundation to ensure that you are running secured virtual machine images, secure container images. Those are signed. Those are protected using mandatory access control technology. The communications between your virtual environments are automatically encrypted using the firewalling and VPN technology that we have in RHEL. And we're isolating root processes and users from each other. Uh, RHEL 7.5 just introduced a new mount namespace capability for containers to further isolate things like root in a container and not being root in the host, right? That's, you don't generally want that. And we have lots of partners that we're working with as well. But where else are we going? So some of this has actually been partially delivered already, but I do want to hit a, con um, a couple of these things. Uh, you know, we acquired this company called CoreOS. It sort of made some news recently, right? So look for enhancements around how you manage secrets, especially for containers. CoreOS is one of the key contributors to the etcd standard that is used by the container world to store secrets in. Also, we're really interested in trusted execution environments. Right? I've listed a few up here. Uh, the secure guard extensions, the secure uh, virtual environments, or yeah, actually it's supposed to be SEV, sorry, I got that acronym wrong, and trust zones from the ARM space. These are all evolving areas of allowing it a program, a process, a container to have an encrypted memory space that only it has access to. The host system does not have access to that encrypted memory space. You can imagine that that would be very interesting for things like a Tang server so that when it generates its public private key pair, maybe that should be in its own encrypted enclave, right? Lots of potential there, lots of work still required. I want to touch upon two things real quick. 
and that is the Container Health Index. I had the privilege of being the first presentation at last summit just after we announced the Container Health Index. So I had this slide in there and technically no one knew about it until uh, just before I spoke about it, which is kind of cool. Uh, the Container Health Index is something that Red Hat makes available where we actually provide a, a letter grade and an easy way for you to validate that the container that you want to run that perhaps includes Apache or PHP, et cetera, is it secure? Is it trustworthy? Has it been signed? Is it up to date with the latest security patches? So this is about validating external third-party technology using Red Hat's container registry. Now that's what we do today. Hey, guess what? CoreOS has this really great capability called Claire, so that as part of your CI CD process, you can generate, obviously when you generate and sign your own, uh, or generate your own container images, you can actually automatically scan it for security vulnerabilities. So this is private registry. The health container index, container health index is public. This is for private registries. So all I will say is watch this space. Uh, there's lots of activity that can be, that, that will happen in this space. We specifically talked about Quay uh, in our most recent press release around the directions of what we're headed with CoreOS. Finally, automating compliance. There's actually an entire lab around practical SCAP, which is our primary tool that we, that we talk about compliance, but we also have uh, Ansible and satellite and insights that helps us with the compliance requirements that you have. When I say compliance, I'm talking about being compliant against government standards or your own industry standards, PCI DSS, DSS TIG, that kind of thing. All right. We also have something that I don't think a lot of people know about, and that's called the Vulnerability API. You can see the last entry here. Uh, we have customers that have said, hey, I've written my own scanning tool in Puppet. It's great, where do you get your data from? Well, first off, you didn't even have to write it in Puppet. We actually give you one, it's called OpenSCAP. But if you did, that's great, where are you getting your data from? And they may not have even known about it, but we have this great Vulnerability API that allows you to query us and actually determine the state of a CDE, whether or not we've patched it, if we patched it, what systems does it apply to? What was our scoring on that CVE, et cetera? It's all public. You can just get directly to it. But where are we headed? We're looking at things like compliance as a service, right? If you consume infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, why not compliance as a service? I'm going to just kind of leave that there. Keep in mind that's something, in, especially in the public cloud space. More automatic scanning and remediation. We can already do that today. We're looking at extending that with our rail system roles for Ansible. There's an interesting demo in our booth of something we call session recording. Now, in Europe, this may not be applicable, but some of you may need to actually record everything a customer or a user has done on the system, keystroke by keystroke, window move by window move. We actually have some tools that we're working on uh, in the upstream community for this space. And we're looking at making it even easier for people to contribute to the open SCAP and compliance standards by moving towards something called open security control or open control, right? And reducing the time that it takes for us to undergo FIPS and common criteria certification. Yeah. Uh, I will leave this for uh, exercise for the reader, but this is an example of an open SCAP scan result. It gives you very quick traffic light way of looking at how compliant is my system to a particular security standard. Again, this is built into RHEL. I want to hit two things real quick. Uh, I'm actually going to kind of skip over this slide other than saying, go talk to our security experts. They are on the, they may, they may, they may be right outside. I think they may actually be down on the first floor. And they will tell you what we are doing to respond to security threats, including those that are very important, high risk, and do not carry a fancy logo. But there are some that do carry fancy logos. Spectre Meltdown, right? Everybody loves this. Spectre Meltdown. We're under embargo. The whole industry had them under embargo. That allowed us to be responsible about providing patches as rapidly as, as possible. Uh, the embargo broke early. We were one of the handful of vendors that was ready day one with patches for your system. Um, I'm not naming names, but there are plenty that were not, right? And this was not easy. And no, we didn't have everything available day one. And in fact, we've continued to work on and refine the performance impact of the patches to address Spectre and Meltdown vulnerabilities. Uh, Spectre Meltdown, we're just one class of many. Uh, we will continue to make available uh, security patches for all of our supported releases of all of our products, including RHEL 5, right? As a matter of fact, here's a quick snapshot. The yellow line 
uh, at the top represents the total number of flaws that are sort of in the ecosystem of things that we evaluate. I'm looking at the left chart. The red line indicates how many CVEs we've actually addressed. Because just because there's a flaw out there doesn't mean it even applies to our products. And when it does, we choose to fix it. That's one of the CVEs that we fix. But we know that every time that you have to touch the system, it's an impact on you. So we try to reduce the number of times that you have to touch your system by bundling the fixes for these CVEs together into uh, Red Hat security assessments. And we do that at a significantly lower rate. So out of the 2,704 possible flaws so far in, 20, well, in 2017, we chose to address 1,391 of them with 583 errata releases, security advisory releases. So you didn't have to touch your system 2,700 times or 1,300 times. It was only 500 times. And that's obviously not all your systems. The chart on the right, just real quickly, just shows you that as our products continue to mature, the number of criticals importance generally go down. But take a look at the volume. It's not really dropping much. The far line on the right is currently to date 2018. The world's not getting any simpler, right? All right, so in conclusion, we've talked about secure foundations. We've talked about hybrid cloud deployments and where we're headed with that. We've talked about automating security compliance, addressing CVEs. And I've given you a few links to other sessions to, to look at. We've also spent some time talking about network-bound disk encryption. Uh, here are some links that you might want to investigate later. Come visit us in the booth for sure. I'm not going to spend time on these. You'll have these as an access. Some more additional URLs. Secalert at redhat.com, everyone. In case you forget and you have a security concern, go there. Finally, please fill out your session survey. Visit the booth. Ask us questions. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate it.